we're going to be over here in 1 Samuel 15. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about something I was burdened on me this morning. I've been thinking about it a little bit this week, uh, but this morning I was a little conflicted. So I, every week, <clears throat> I and I know Brother Sam's the same way, we, we pray and ask God for clarity. I don't know. I have no idea what I'm going to preach most weeks. Most weeks I have no clue until Saturday morning or Sunday morning, sometimes three hours before we meet. And so the Lord just has to lead me and I seek His face and read through scriptures all week and carefully praying about needs of the church, our church. Uh, if, we're, if I'm not careful, me personally, uh, considering we put our messages online, if I'm not careful, I'll start trying to preach to people outside of the assembly. You know, I, oh, they, you know, they need to hear this, or they need to hear this doctrine. I want them to know this, or maybe they'll think this is interesting, and I'll start appealing to people outside of our assembly. But I think it's more important, uh, and it's crucial that we preach to our assembly and take care of the needs here at home. And uh, that's what this message is going to be directed to, to our own people. Amen. So I'm going to be over here in First Samuel 15. Uh, but I want to talk to you so about a very important subject I think we need to understand, and I think that it's good for us to take heed, including myself. This, this message is directed to me as much as it is as everybody else in here. Um, I think it's very crucial we understand this concept and this particular... This is a topical, okay? It's a topical message. Um, <clears throat> but I see some needs in the church, um, and I know there are some needs in the church that need to be met, some physical, some spiritual, some mental, some financial, um, just a lot of things going on. So maybe this will help. And I want you to take this as a spirit of meekness, please. Don't let me come across. I hope I don't come across as I'm preaching to you to get right or I'm preaching to them to do right. I'm not. That's not any way I want to point this or direct this. Uh, but I want to be a help, and I hope it helps me too, and I believe it will. It's helped me a little bit already. Um, but as an introduction, I want to talk a little bit <clears throat> uh, that there are a few things, if any, that can hinder our walk with God if we are walking in the Spirit. I believe that if we're walking in the Spirit, there are very few things that can hinder us from, from, from pleasing God. Amen. Do you believe that? I believe that if we, if we have the power of the Spirit of God on us, there is nothing that can be impossible to us. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. But if we abide in Christ and we walk in the Spirit, we are more than conquerors. Amen. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ. Romans 8, 35, the Bible says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecutions or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Amen. I believe we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Amen. The church has been empowered with the Spirit to successfully walk through some of the most difficult adversities to fulfill the Lord's will in His kingdom. And each individual Christian is partaker of the heavenly blessings and gifts of the local, visible body of Christ, as spoken, in, as spoken of in Romans 12 and also in 1 Corinthians 12. This church has been empowered and been given gifts. Amen. We have the blessings and benefits. Unfortunately, for those that are not in a church who need to be in a church, they can't be partakers of these heavenly gifts that Christ gives the body. I'm so thankful that we have a house of God to come to and to assemble and to enjoy the blessings of the gifts to do what we do on a weekly basis, offer spiritual sacrifices to God, preach the gospel to every creature, carry out and protect the ordinances. Amen. Christ has commissioned the local church these things. Amen. We have the blessings of the gifts. Each one of us has a gift. Amen. We can execute those gifts in this body and it, and it helps others. Now I want you to understand that as we go forward with this message. Understand that each one of us that are members of this body have a gift. And that gift, according to what the Bible teaches in 1 Corinthians 12, 4, I'm going to read it, concerning gifts. <clears throat> now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Now listen. The Bible says in verse 7, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. 
Your spiritual gift that you have that God has given you to exercise in the body is to our profit, to the body's profit, and it exalts Christ in the meantime. Okay, we offer spiritual sacrifices. <clears throat> Amen. Now, though Christ, I, now I, before I start getting into this other half of this introduction, we, under, we have to understand those things, that we are a blessing to others. Amen. There are some people in our midst that need some help. Amen. Uh, there's some people that have gone through some things in their life that that uh, the the body is here to help. Amen. Uh, but though Christ rules in our midst, though the Spirit makes intercession with the saints and their Lord, and though we have the promises of obtaining great success, even though the Lord Jesus said we can pluck up and move mountains with even faith as a grain of mustard seed. And even though we have access to the throne of grace to help us in time of need and want, much of our own plight as Christians here in this body, much of our own plight and failures that we will experience in this life will be credited to that which our generation lightly esteems as evil or bad or wrong, and possibly even our own church. Our own plight and our own failures can take place because of our flesh and allowing our flesh to get in the way. The Bible says that pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall. And I want to talk to you today specifically about one particular sin of the flesh that I believe may have captivated some of us. And like I told you before, this message is just as much for me as it is for anyone else. If, the, if you will take heed and open your ears and listen today, this message is for me. The sin that I'm concerning, uh, that I'm talking about today is going to be the sin of stubbornness. The sin of stubbornness. The Bible has a few things to say about stubbornness. I told you earlier that our generation lightly esteems this particular issue. Um, You've heard people talk about stubbornness as, well, the, you know, my husband's stubborn, my wife's stubborn, she don't listen to me, she just, she's very hard-headed. And we kind of take that lightly, like, oh, <laughs> yeah, they're stubborn, they're just the way they are, that's just the way they are, you got to deal with them. And we kind of take it lightly. <clears throat> that's what we understand. But the Bible has some things to say about stubbornness. Um, and as a matter of fact, when we look at it, uh, it we need to take careful understanding of what the Bible teaches concerning stubbornness. Much like the hardened heart, stubbornness is a fruit of pride. Okay, It comes from pride. That's where it comes from. Stubbornness is my way or the highway. You've heard that before, that cliche. A stubborn Christian that is rarely wrong, is self-willed, refuses offers to help, and perhaps blessings given to them by others in the church. Stubbornness in the Christian will possibly hear instruction, but decline obedience. Stubbornness in the Christian asks questions and seeks help, but has already premeditated the answer or solution. You ever have somebody ask you a question, ask a favor? Hey, can you help me with this? What do I do about this? How do I handle this? And you start to tell them, and then they reject everything you just told them. <laughs> we had somebody in our assembly like that uh, about a year ago, a year and a half ago. Uh, this particular individual came into our body one night. I remember, um, I want to say it was a Wednesday night, came in and had some concerns about uh, feeding their child some particular things and then what they should administer their child as far as liquids. And this person asked, I think, our pastor and said, well, um, what, do I, what should I use to hydrate so-and-so? And I believe uh, he had said that water's the best thing and right away, cut him off. No, 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 that's... That's not what they need. We, we, that's not what it is. Why did you ask? <laughs> Why did you even ask? Premeditated as a solution. That's what I'm talking about there. Uh, stubbornness in a Christian doesn't want the truth most times, just wants others to confirm that what they already believe is the truth. Do you hear what I just said? I'm going to repeat it. Stubbornness in the Christian doesn't want the truth most times just wants others to confirm that what they already believe is the truth, in spite of whether, they, whether or not they may be wrong. A stubborn Christian is nearly unchangeable in their ways 
As a stubborn donkey wedged between barbed wire as he kicks and screams when his keeper comes to free him from his painful despair, even after being freed from the entanglement of the barbed wire fence, will return hither too. Sometimes we act like a bunch of donkeys, and that's, you know, a lot of times to our failures. It ends up being a, a plight of ours when we listen to preaching and we listen to admonishment and we, we, we understand the truth and we know what will help us. But because we are set in our ways and because we want what we want and because it's on our terms and my way or the highway, we'll receive instruction with conditions because it can't interfere with what I already know. So I'm going to go over here to 1 Samuel 15, verse number 23. We're going to see somebody that's really stubborn, and that's King Saul. You've probably heard of the story before. It's very popular. 1 King, or excuse me, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse number 23. The Bible says, This is Samuel talking to Saul, for rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. You hear that a lot. We've heard some preachings on that. But I don't hear very many messages on the second part of it. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Whoa. Rebellion's bad enough. And rebellion's already bad enough that Samuel here in the Bible makes it very clear that he compares it to the sin of witchcraft. Wow. But now when you go to the second part of that, it says stubbornness, a stubborn Christian, a stubborn man, the man who will not receive instruction because he knows it all already, or maybe he's doing things the way he wants to do in spite of very precise instructions. Stubbornness, the Bible says, is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Saul had good intentions. Let me remind you. Saul had very good intentions, but he disobeyed clear instruction. Very precise. You see, he was very stubborn. And Samuel pointed that out. Well, how was he stubborn? Well, the fact that <clears throat> he was given clear instructions to completely wipe out the Amalekites and the king Agag himself completely obliterate them. Not even man, woman, suckling, or infant should live or survive. No animals, nothing. Wipe them all out. Very clear instruction. God made it very clear. Well, we find that <coughs> Saul had some things in his heart that was not right with God. He decided to do partial obedience, and we've talked about that before, I think, in messages past. But I like to use this because it's very vivid about how stubbornness can really affect us, and it can really cause us to go to a life of defeat. And we find that later on, Saul, eventually, after all the sin that he committed, he committed three major uh, offenses against God. He sacrificed when he wasn't supposed to. He didn't kill everyone they were supposed to. And then he went after a witch for her uh, counsel. And the Bible says he ended up dying. Um, and as a matter of fact, I found out recently that I don't believe Saul actually killed himself. We can talk about that later. I found some stuff. It's interesting. Maybe we can talk about it later. But I've always thought that Saul committed suicide. I believe it was attempted suicide. And somebody else finished him off. Um, <clears throat> but uh, So I want to talk to you today about stubbornness. If the Bible considers stubbornness as, as the sin of iniquity and idolatry, then we need to know what stubbornness is, identify it, and repent of it. Wouldn't you agree? Amen? I don't think the Bible talks anything good about stubbornness at all. As a, fact, as a matter of fact, the Bible doesn't have anything good to say about stubbornness, just as much as pride. There's nothing in the Bible today, friend, that the Bible talks about uh, pride being anything good. Nothing good about pride. We hear pride a lot <coughs> in our public schools. To, you know, It's Pride Week. Learn to be proud and pride and all this stuff, blah, blah, blah. But the Bible never mentions anything good about pride. And I believe the same thing is true for stubbornness. Stubbornness is never mentioned as a fruit of the Spirit or the character of the believer in Scripture. Right. And we take it lightly. Oh, it's, you know, I'm just stubborn in some things. And look, honestly, I don't, I don't you know, we joke about that and that's okay. And, and sometimes we give each other a hard time. You know, you're stubborn. You don't want to listen to anything. And that's, that's fine. But when it comes to obedience to God and the church, we just need to consider some stuff here. Stubbornness can surely hinder God's blessings and workings in His people. And I believe stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, making us, not God, but us, the ruler and God, rather than the Spirit. Because we've already got a course that we're going on, and if we are instructed or maybe taught, or maybe the, the Lord is wanting us to do a certain thing specifically, well, that doesn't really work. I'll do it halfway, but that doesn't all work the way it should. And now we're, now we're taking leadership. 
because we're stubborn. We don't want to do it the way God said to do it. So I think this can be an issue, okay? And maybe it's an issue in our body. It could be. But I believe uh, when the Christian is stubborn, he opposes himself. That's one point I want to make today. When the Christian is stubborn, he opposes himself. I'm going to go over here to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Paul mentions this. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. And the Bible says <coughs> uh, in verse number 24, and, as a ser- and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the knowledge of the truth. You see, you see here the Bible talks about when they oppose themselves, there need to be some repentance that takes place. I believe that stubbornness, when you're stubborn and you don't allow yourself to submit to the Spirit of God and leadership to help you in whatever thing you need help in, it can cause you to oppose yourself and therefore it might require you to have repentance in your life. Um, Now, I do believe the church is not permitted to strive against the unwilling and stubborn Christian, only teach and be patient and gentle. Amen. We have a pastor here that is instructed by the Word of God to be apt to teach, patient and be gentle. Amen. Our pastor, I know, has had many times that he has had to instruct those that oppose themselves. The Lord also, as the shepherd and bishop of our souls, has oftentimes in my life personally had to... uh, uh, correct me on some things because I was stubborn because I wanted it my way or the highway. If it doesn't fit my criteria, it, it, it makes me uncomfortable, then I don't really want to do it the way that the Bible teaches. Or maybe I've received instruction from somebody that's trying to help me. Maybe I've asked for help and somebody in my life has come along the way. God has sent somebody to me to show me there's some sin there and you need to take heed. Somebody that knows more than you or maybe can see the problem from a different angle. Maybe you can't see. And when you listen, you get stubborn and you allow yourself to shut off because it's your way the highway. Amen. Uh, that can cause great failure in our life. Amen. I believe almost 100% of the problems we face in our life <laughs> as Christians is ourselves. I've taught before, I've, I've, I've preached before in the past that I believe most of the problem that we have in our families and the basic things of life is the person that we look at in that mirror every day. I believe it. I believe sometimes when we come into the house of God and we're looking for help from other people, maybe some instruction, some advice, maybe we're looking to the scriptures and we want to know how to handle this problem. We don't know how to overcome it. And we want to ask uh, for advice and help and instruction, admonition, something from the scriptures. And we're looking for God to do something in our life to help us. We'll often get instruction, but then it contradicts some things that we've already premeditated in our mind. Well, it can't work this way or that way, so I'm going to do it this way, and I'm going to ask for advice, but it's going to be under certain conditions because we're stubborn. Maybe. I don't know. I believe it's the office of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. It's His administerial office to correct the wayfaring and self-destructive Christian through preaching and teaching with long-suffering and at times admonition. Amen. I believe that. You know, it's not my job, it's not your job, it's none of our job to go and sharply rebuke somebody that's walking wayfaring. You know, it's, all, it's not always my job, it's not always Brother Sam's job, it's not always any one of your other's jobs to, to see someone that's opposing themselves. Now, I'm not saying every time, but I am saying that there is not, it's not always our jobs to, to, to go to that person and try to tell them, hey, you're doing this wrong, you need to get it right. Sometimes we need to make sure and be careful that we let the Spirit do the work. You understand what I'm saying? We need to let the Spirit work in someone's life. Amen. There's times when we're going to have people come into this, into this assembly and maybe they want to be members. Maybe they want to have, uh, they want to learn some doctrines. Maybe they want to learn the truth. Maybe they're seeking it. Maybe the Lord's working on them. And it doesn't happen instantly and they need to hear some preaching and they need to get instructed. They need to be taught. They don't know and understand. That's why I'm here. I'm here because I want to be taught. I'm not, I'm not here because I know it all. I'm not here because I got it all together. I'm here because I don't have it together. I am a miserable failure without the Lord. I need help. Man, I need instruction. I need to be taught. And if it's going to be me being taught, that requires me to be humble and listen and pay attention. Amen. And it's not always the pastor's job to lead and take your hand and hold you and, and like a little baby. Come on, son. Here, I'll help you. You know, 
We've had people like that in the past where they want their hand to be held. They can't handle situations in their past. But then when you try to instruct them and help them in the crisis that they're facing, they want nothing to do with it. Or they listen, and, oh, oh, that's great. Yeah, amen. I, I never thought of that before. Wow. But then you watch them, and then they continue going after the same thing and getting the same results. Well, well what happened to the instruction that I gave you? Well, I, I thought about it, but it, it doesn't really work for me. Well, you see where I'm going with this. It's, it's kind of like one of those things that we're, we're, the, the church is here to help us. Christ is here in our midst because we need help. We are people that are in desperate need of something better than ourselves. And that's where the Spirit comes in and helps us <clears throat> and, and encourages us. And through the preaching and the teaching of the Scriptures to help us, we can take admonishment and learn from it and correct our ways, and it will actually help us to prosper. Remember the gifts, the spiritual gifts. There's some in here that have gifts of healing. Okay, there's some folks in here that have the gift of healing. There is, a, I believe, there's God's given us a way to find out the remedy for some of the health problems that we have in America, and we have a really good opportunity with what's down the street <coughs> at this clinic. There's a lot of great things going on down there. I've heard a lot of wonderful things, but there's there's some things that that I believe some of us have wisdom in more than others and when we take the advice of the wisdom we should really take it seriously and let it apply to our life would this be beneficial to me because I'm tired of getting the same results but because of stubbornness and because we think we're right about things we will just have a disconnect in our mind and we won't allow ourselves to yield to the one that's giving us and, and blessing us with the gift that's what the gifts are for, for the profit with all. It profits us. It helps us. I come to this church because I get blessed by some that are an encouragement to me. I get blessed by some that have the gift of prophecy. I have the, some that have the gift of admonishment and helping and exhorting. I have, there's gifts in this body to be executed, and I, ble I am getting blessed for that. But if I get stubborn and I allow myself to turn off from those things, how is that going to benefit and profit me as a child of God to grow? Man, there's folks today that have issues in their life and there's ailments and we give them admonishment over and over and over and over and over and over and over. This is what the problem is. This is how you resolve it. You need to think about it and consider it. But you continue on the same path and the same road. And that's where we can get ourselves in trouble. And that's where we end up going down to the road of failure and destruction because God's given us a blessing here in this body to take heed. And we don't want it because we're stubborn. It's the stubbornness of the Christian that will likely believe that he is steadfast in the faith, quote, when the truth is he is actually stubborn in his own ways. In times of my past, I, I've thought about my personal thoughts and my heart and my intentions and my motives and <clears throat> I've gotten some advice, I've gotten some spiritual leadership and some counsel on some things that I need to improve in, maybe I should consider, and I will turn them off because I think, well, they don't understand my situation, you know. I, I, I know what I'm doing here. They just don't like my walk with God, and they don't like my zeal. They don't like my steadfastness. So I don't really need to listen to them. I know what I'm doing. I got this together, you know, and I'm, I've deceived myself. I'm not, I've not taken the time to be humble and listen to what someone else has to tell me about something in my life that they would see could be improved. Amen? So I think that there's an issue here where we can, we can look for improvement. We can look for help if we are not so stubborn. When the Christian is stubborn, this is my second point, when the Christian is stubborn in the church... It can lead to rejection of the spiritual gifts. I touched on that a little bit. I'm going to go over here to 1 Corinthians 12. I want to look at this, 1 Corinthians 12, if you don't mind turning there. I'm going to be here for just a minute. And I'm going to go over to Romans 14 a little bit later and talk about that. But 1 Corinthians 12 talks about spiritual gifts. That's what the chapter is about. Amen. Uh, the local visible body has been blessed with spiritual gifts. Now, <clears throat> I want you to notice something over here in 1 Corinthians 12, 26. Go over here to 1 Corinthians 12, 26. Look what the Bible says here. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. You see there? How we're one body and one bread. Amen. One member, when it suffers, if my hand is hurting, it's going to affect the rest of my body. Amen. So the rest of my body has to 
compromise to help and to suffice the strength and the need for this hand that's very weak. So the Bible says here, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Man, you know what that's talking about. It's talking about when somebody in our body gets blessed, we all rejoice with them. When somebody in our body is hurting, going through a trial, we all hurt with them, we mourn with them. Man, we suffer together, we rejoice together. It's one body. We're all baptized into one body. Amen. So when we look at this verse, I want you to be careful to understand that because we are one body and when one member suffers, all of us suffer, keep in mind, when one of us is suffering and we request the prayers of the other saints in the body, but yet we're not willing to do anything about our stubbornness and we want to continue down the same way and we come week after week after week after week after week with the same prayer because nothing's happening in your life. You don't understand why you're not getting better. You don't understand why your spiritual condition is not improving, why you can't get victory over sin, why there's something in your life you still don't understand and it's very unclear. Have you considered your stubbornness? Have you considered your stubbornness? When God wants to do something in you and the prayers of the saints are behind you, but there's still one major factor that's getting in the way, and it's our flesh. I am guilty of this. Let me tell you, I am very guilty of this. With wanting the prayers and needing the help and the encouragement, but yet I go back right back to the same way I was when I leave the assembly, like there's no change. You know, and, and, and when I get spiritual encouragement here and I don't take it and use it and I don't put away my stubbornness, I just stay in the same way I've been. Just go down the same path. There's no change. Unchangeable and unmovable. You know, not willing to take instruction because my way is the highway. I think that that's when we cause the body who is suffering with us to continue that suffrage. You understand what I'm saying? There's some people in our midst, maybe, that is going through some problems that they're trying to overcome, and we have prayed with them, we have fasted with them, we want them to improve, we want them to have help, but then because of their stubbornness, after week after week after week of not taking instruction and not actually taking and applying what they've heard to their actions and behavior, now they continue that suffrage and they come back with the same story and we're still suffering with them. You see how it can cause a problem with our body. And before you know it, all of the body is suffering con constantly more than it should because somebody is being stubborn. You see how it can affect everybody. It can affect everyone for longer than it should unnecessarily. You know, if we would just take advice from people that have experience, there's been people in our past that have left this body that have been instructed and tried to have been helped on some things that they needed help with, that they ask help for, you give them instruction, then they reject it, reject it, reject it. And then by the end of it, they're bitter, they're, 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 they're displeased and they're discontented and they don't understand why. It's probably because they're stubborn. You don't want to do what you've been told. It's that simple. You're a donkey that's in the barbed wire and you're, you're begging and screaming for help, but when somebody comes to help, you kick and, and bite them. That's the character of a donkey. They're stubborn. That's what they are. Okay? An ass's colt. They're very stubborn. You ever had one? You ever been around one? Oh, 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 I don't want to do that. I'm going to get away from me. I mean, that's how they are. They're very, they, they'll kick you. They don't want anything to do with you. But they're entangled, you see? And when someone tries to go and help them and rescue them out of their condition, here's the way you can improve. This is what you have to do, step by step by step. You do that, you're going to find an answer in your remedy. But if you continue down the same path and you don't take instruction, and you don't listen to what the Word of God teaches about it, and you continue your own way on behalf of stubbornness, then you're going to get the same results. You're going to get the same results. Amen? There's some folks in here that need some help physically. And there's been some instruction given. I've heard it. There's been some instruction. Very kind, very generous instruction. A lot of knowledge. But then when it actually applies to their life personally at home or in, in, in wherever it's at, it's, it's almost like it's, you didn't even hear it. And, and, then you, and then we hear the same thing coming back to church. Well, I'm, I'm having this problem. I don't understand what's going on. I'm, I'm in a terrible shape or whatever it is. And, but, but we've instructed you. God's, God's here to give you help, to help you. Amen? Whatever infirmity it is, we're praying, we're asking God to do something. But then the flesh gets in the way, you know, because maybe it, it might make us uncomfortable to take the extra step to do what's been told. Stubbornness. 
And see, it can affect the body. It can affect the body needlessly at that. Remember, Romans 14, 7 says this, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. My, my self-will and my, you know, my flesh, if I get into the flesh and I give into sin, it affects everybody. Now, maybe not right off the bat, there's some sins that are secret that only the Lord knows, but eventually it will get manifest. And we just need to consider that. There are members of the body that desire to serve and use their spiritual gift. But listen, but the gift is neglected when we refuse to accept it. One of the worst things that we can do as Christians <clears throat> is not necessarily leaving off giving gifts to others. But sometimes the, one of the worst things we can do and that would cause issues is when somebody wants to bless us and we reject the blessing because maybe we're too proud to take it. Maybe we have a, a sense of, well, I don't deserve that, so I'm not going to take that. But that's, that's not your business. Listen to me carefully. It's not our business. If somebody in this body that has the anointing of God, that, is, that is, has a spiritual gift that wants to exercise that gift toward you as another member, as a brother or sister in Christ, and you refuse that, now you're suppressing their gift. You understand? There's a church, so-called, that will not allow anybody other than one man, or maybe two, to preach in the assembly. They will not allow it. Now, where does that man get authority to do that? Now, there's some folks in that church that feel like they're called. They want to preach. They want to teach. They got some wisdom. They got some, they got some zeal. They want to exercise it to see if it's a calling of God. But this man suppresses it, won't allow it. As a matter of fact, because he's the pastor, he says that he has the authority to say that. I don't think so, pal. You don't have the authority to tell God that nobody else is allowed to exercise a gift. How do you know? You're not even giving them an opportunity to try it. You're suppressing their gifts. You understand? Suppressing the gift. There's folks in our body that need some help. And for those that are willing, that are able, we should help them. But when we help them, I hope and pray that the person that needs the help would not reject it. Amen? I agree with that. I think that's right. I think if, some, if God's blessed us with some gifts in this body, we should be able to exercise them freely. And it benefits. That's the blessing of it. It benefits. Amen. Even though you might not think that it benefits your way because maybe it's some stubbornness that may be lying in there somewhere, it's still a benefit to you. Maybe not physically, but spiritually. You never know. You've got to let it, let it work out. But if you, don't, if you just reject the gift and you reject the, uh, the, the, the blessing that somebody wants to be to you, the love that somebody has toward you, then you're suppressing it. And that's not how the body operates, friend. You know, the Apostle Paul accepted the gifts from the Philippi. They were the only ones that communicated with him concerning gifts when he left Macedonia. And you know what he didn't do? He didn't reject it. He didn't reject it. He needed some help. Apostle Paul needed some help. Some of the apostles needed some help. And they didn't reject it. They were very thankful. And we should have the same attitude in our body. So there are other people in our body that want to exercise their gift. Don't suppress them. If they want to bless you with it, let them. Put your stubbornness aside and let them. Amen? God's commanding us to do that. We see that in 1 Corinthians 12. It affects other people. When we can't give and offer gifts because of somebody else's stubbornness, it affects others. There's some examples in Scripture <coughs> uh, that the stubbornness has affected some other saints. Moses made up his mind he needed someone other than himself to speak for God. You remember that when he was in the mount and he saw the burning bush? God called him to go to Egypt. Exodus chapter 4, verses 10. When the Bible says that God told him, you're going to go speak and be my mouthpiece, what did Moses do? But, see God, I, I can't. I, I'm not eloquent of speech. I'm not eloquent. I can't do that. Can you please somebody send somebody else? What did God do? He got angry, didn't he? Now maybe, maybe it could be because Moses was a little stubborn because he didn't want to get out of his comfort zone. He, know he, he knows he couldn't speak eloquently, so he doesn't feel like he can be used. He's not going to be very successful, so he starts to bug the Lord here, and the Lord gets angry with him, and it causes God to be frustrated, and so he sends Aaron. 
So we could possibly see a case of stubbornness there. Israel was stubborn and rebellious even after all the miracles they witnessed through God's deliverance of them from their enemies in Deuteronomy 9, 27. The Bible says they were, they were, Moses said they were stubborn and rebellious since the day he knew them. Rebellion, stubbornness. The congregation was stubborn and desired an earthly king rather than the Almighty to rule them in 1 Samuel 8. You remember that? That's what brought along Saul, King Saul. See, Israel, the problem with them was not the fact that, it wasn't the fact that Samuel's children was causing the issue and they didn't walk with the Lord as Samuel did. That wasn't the issue. That was an excuse. And the fact of the matter was they wanted a king to rule over them because God was not going to rule over them. They had made a determination that God was not going to rule over them and God pointed that out. It was because of their stubbornness. It was stubbornness that kept them from God ruling over them. Same thing with Jews. Same thing with Israel. Uh, in, in the New Testament, when the Pharisees listened to the Lord, it's talking uh, about the kingdom and being baptized into the kingdom and the gospel of the kingdom, they were very envious. They were stubborn. Okay. <clears throat> Even a stubborn child in the Scriptures, listen to this. Even a stubborn child, the Bible says if you have a revolting and rebellious and stubborn child that's against his parents, the Bible says he was fit to be stoned to death. That's what God thinks about stubbornness. Over there in Deuteronomy 21, 18 through 21, the Bible gives strict instructions. What you are to do with a child that is stubborn, that won't listen to your instruction, who's a glutton, a wine bibber, a drunkard, doesn't listen to your authority, very stubborn, doesn't do what you tell them to, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth admonition. Let's go read what God says about it. He says, well, you bring them to the elders of the city and this whole city will stone them right there in front. That's what God thinks about stubbornness. Very serious stuff. The strange woman in the Bible is depicted as loud and stubborn. She's stubborn. Uh, in Proverbs 7.11, that's a strange woman. The Bible says that Peter was often stubborn in the church. We find that the first church that, that the Lord ever started right there in the New Testament, the first bishop of the church was even stubborn, rebuking the Lord for performing the very thing he was sent to do. Go to Matthew chapter 16. I'm almost done. Matthew 16. Let's look at this. Peter, the apostle, the one chosen by Christ himself, looked to be a little bit stubborn here. Matthew 16, uh, in verse number 21, the Bible says this, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples. Now, this is interesting. Peter said that Christ... That, that the Lord was Christ and He was the Son of the living God. He had just confessed this. <clears throat> but then we read right down here in verse 21. Uh, the Bible says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto His disciples how that He must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Now Christ is dep depicting here and prophesying of His death, burial, and resurrection. This was why He was sent. And now look what happened here. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Boy, Peter started getting a little bit stubborn because he was very jealous of the Lord here, but he was also getting in the way of the Lord's will. You see, the Lord's will for us is to exercise gifts. The Lord's will for us is to glorify Christ. And sometimes our stubbornness can get in the way of the will of God. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those things that be of men. We saw another instance where Peter... <coughs> um, well, let me back up. In verse number 24, I want to point this out. The Bible says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples... Now, this is right after this takes place, after the Lord rebukes him. He, get, he rebukes the Lord, then the Lord rebukes him. Verse 24, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, isn't that contrary of rebellion and stubbornness? It is, isn't it? You're, you're denying yourself, your knowledge, your experience, and you deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow Christ. Don't you know we're called disciples? You know what disciple is? Disciplined one. When you're in the army and the army recruit says, be here at 7 a.m. sharp, you show up at 7.01, you're in trouble. Am I right? You show up at 7.01, you're in trouble. You show up at 7 
zero, zero, point zero, one, you're in trouble. Am I right? You're not standing there in salute or whatever y'all do there at seven, one, or at seven, zero, 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 you're in trouble. The reason why is because they teach you discipline, okay? The soldier of Christ, who is also a disciple, the Christian, should be the same, amen? We are here in Christ's kingdom. We are to be disciplined, amen? We are disciplined, which is, <coughs> which is what the Lord's talking about here. If any will come after me, let him deny himself. Now, Peter also uh, got stubborn again. He didn't want the Lord to be arrested there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember, he cut off the, that, that guard's ear, that guy? Cut it off because he was jealous of his Lord. But it provoked, it provoked Peter. What he was seeing happen in that garden provoked him to be stubborn. He wouldn't let the, word, the, the, the will of the Lord, after the Lord had taught him over and over, this is what's going to happen to me. My temple's going to be buried and raised in third day. on the third day. I'm going to be offered for the people. He's been taught this throughout his ministry. And the Peter still was stubborn in his ways. Amen? And he got in the way of the will of God. And that's when the Lord rebuked him again. <laughs> and that's how we can be as Christians. We can listen to admonition over and over and over, be told the same things about the doctrines that we hear here, and then we still don't get it, still don't get it. That's just the way sheep are, I guess. <laughs> we get into trouble so many times, and it's because of our flesh. We just have to battle it, amen? And let the Lord deal with it, amen? Uh, so sometimes we get in the way of the will of the Lord. And the last thing, perhaps the issue with Paul and Barnabas concerning Mark was the case of stubbornness from one or the other. You remember they were over there in Acts 15 when Barnabas wanted to take Mark, but then Paul said, I don't think it's good that he go with us. Now, for whatever reason that is, somebody was being stubborn, <laughs> possibly. So it caused a big division, and they split apart. They, the Bible says they, they split asunder. Man, one went the other way. Paul took Silas, and then uh, Barnabas took Mark. And uh, so we, we, we can see some issues with stubbornness in the Scriptures. That's all I want to talk about, really. I just want to address that, you know, if... if if there's some things in our life that maybe we've been given admonition to and we listen to it, but we don't actually apply them to our life, and then we wonder why our condition is still the same, maybe we should consider our heart, and maybe we should consider stubbornness. Amen. We all deal with it. I deal with it. I'm dealing with it right now. I'm trying to make sure that I'm very careful. That's why I wanted to preach on it, because it helps me to remind myself, hey, uh, I don't have it all together. Maybe I should just put up my pride and listen to what somebody's telling me. Maybe somebody knows better than I do and listen to them, and it might help my situation. Amen. All right, well, that's all I have. I hope that blessed you. 42 minutes. I'm very sorry. Let's end this thing.